details how the king of pop allegedly groomed them and won over their families. The Jackson estate denies the claims and is now suing HBO. We want to show you a clip now, uh, a bit of the footage from part one. He would run drills with me where you'd be in the hotel room and he would pretend like somebody was coming in and you had to get dressed as fast as possible without making noise. So not getting caught was a big, like, just kind of fundamental. Pop culture expert John Murray calls leaving Neverland disturbing, but understands why critics call it a propaganda piece. Also with us is CNN legal analyst and attorney Ariva Martin. Uh, first off, John, I want to start with you, and because some of these allegations are explosive, they're jaw-dropping. You just heard uh, one of the men talking about these drills that he would allegedly do with Michael Jackson so that they could prevent being caught, uh, you know, as the sexual abuse was underway. What was your reaction after seeing at least part one of this documentary? Well, Emmer, you know, it was a two hour presentation uh, on HBO part one. And I had to watch it in doses. It probably took me about four hours because it was pretty graphic. At times, I felt like the Michael Jackson song. I wanted to scream because it was riveting content. It was compelling content, but it was content pre uh, presented from one point of view. There was no balance in this uh, documentary. There was no other voice added, um, people who support Michael Jackson, legal experts who had been following the case and these stories, people from his uh, his team or who could substantiate these stories. It was just these two gentlemen and their family. And their family often presented uh, these stories, these alleged horrendous acts while giggling and 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 laughing. And it just... It, there were some awkward moments. There were some compelling moments. It was good TV, but I can understand why people feel it's propaganda because it's only one point of view. Uh, Ariva, I want to get your uh, your uh, take on this, uh, your reaction to what John just had to say. And also, we should mention that uh, both of the men that we hear from in, in part one, they actually swore under oath that uh, Michael Jackson did not molest them. Uh, this is when Jackson was alive, so it was many years ago. So how do we reconcile with what they said to what they're alleging now? Amber, I think that's why we've seen the kind of backlash that we've seen with respect to this documentary, because unlike victims that have come forward in some of these other high-profile cases that we've seen who maybe just kept quiet about their abuse, these two men both testified under oath uh, be it at a deposition or at the original sexual molestation trial that Michael Jackson uh, was a part of, and they said he did not abuse them, that there was no sexual abuse. So now you have them coming forth a decade later after Michael Jackson has uh, you know, passed away saying that their original statements that were under oath, under the penalty of perjury, that those statements were false. And many people are doubting their credibility. And to J John's part, a uh, point about the parents, a lot of backlash, too, with respect to these two mothers. People are asking the questions, why did they allow their young sons to sleep in the bed with Michael Jackson? Apparently, one of the boys was left at his uh, ranch for seven days while the parents went on a camping trip. Uh, and they're being accused of being complicit because they accepted first-class air uh, tickets and other lavish gifts from Michael Jackson. And they believe, some call it, you know, allowing yeah. their sons to be pimped out in exchange for money and other gifts. Gifts. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, the fact that these families allowed these boys when they were really young, what, seven, eight, nine years old, to even spend the night at Michael Jackson's Neverland Ranch. I think these sworn statements from the past will be explored in part two, which airs uh, tonight on HBO. John, to you, though, because, you know, we're talking about the other side not getting a chance to dispute uh, these claims. Are we going to hear from anyone else besides the alleged victims, perhaps witnesses or security guards or anyone else? Well, we won't be hearing from any of that in this documentary. Mm. This documentary uh, and the documentary uh, uh, producer came out and said he really wanted to focus just on these gentlemen's point of view. And to Ariva's point, listen, my mother was the biggest Pay LaBelle and Gladys Knight fan, but she wasn't going to allow me to go sleep in their beds. Um, and I'm a very grown man now. She still might give me a side eye if I ended up in either one of those ladies' beds. I mean, you know, the parents and a lot of the things that were presented in this documentary are definitely very questionable. And then there's also the question, what happens next? Will there be a mute Michael Jackson campaign? Very similarly to what's happening with R. Kelly here in the United States. And here's the thing. Michael Jackson is, is no longer with us. He can't come out and defend 
in these things. Only people that know the truth really is is the gentleman in the documentary and Michael Jackson. And so because of that, you know, people are going to continue to support Michael Jackson's music. It's not going to go away. Maybe Walt Disney World won't use it for a commercial, but I think other companies and other people who this music is a part of the soundtrack of their life, they'll continue to embrace it because it has impact and meaning to them. A lot of questions about uh, you know how this if it does impact his legacy. Uh, Ariva, the Jackson estate is now suing HBO for, what, over $100 million, and in part it's because the film's director never reached out to the Jackson estate uh, for comment. We should say Jackson's family obviously denying the allegations, they condemned the documentary, they called it a public lynching, and called uh, these accusers admitted liars. We know you cannot slander or libel a dead person. So under what grounds could the Jackson State be suing for and could it be successful? Well, there's some reports out that there were actual contracts between the uh, Jackson family or the estate and HBO uh, and causes contained in those contracts that uh, prevented them from making disparaging remarks about Michael Jackson. So I know one of the theories that the family is pursuing is, is this, this, this argument that this documentary uh, violates the contractual terms of that agreement. I think more so than anything, the family is pushing back on this narrative because, again, these men gave contradictory statements when Michael Jackson was alive. And I think the community that is so outraged and, and those that are in support of Michael Jackson and his family, uh, it's because it is so one-sided. But I should note that we've seen so many victims come forward uh, and tell their stories, and they don't always fit with what we believe the narrative yeah. of victims should be. So in this era of Me Too, we are learning so much about how individuals that have been traumatized tell their stories. And these victims have every right to come forward and tell what they believe to be their truths. And they are getting a lot of support from other victims and victims' rights organizations. And everybody, do you agree with John when he says, you know, I mean, Michael Jackson's legacy shouldn't be too hurt by it because people are still going to listen to his music. I think there's some, and I've been following this, uh, you know, since the story broke, and I've been watching what's happening on Twitter. There are definitely some people who are saying they will never listen to Michael Jackson's mm. music again. I don't know if, if they become the the masses, if that becomes the predominant, you know, theme that we see, particularly on social media. But there are definitely people who say this documentary is so disturbing that they can never support Michael Jackson again. Last thoughts to you. We have 20 seconds, John. Listen, if you're not going to listen to Michael Jackson any longer, then we yeah, we have to look at the national anthem. We have to look at Amazing Grace. And we have to look at Elvis Presley, James Brown, and so many other iconic artists that have very checkered mm. past. Mm, mm, very good point. We're going to leave it there. John Murray and Ariva Martin, a pleasure to have you both on. Thanks so much. Anytime. All right. Still ahead on CNN Today, an icon.